While the danger of conflict between China and Japan and the threat of North Korea tend to dominate news headlines, East Asia also faces a host of other political, economic and security challenges. This panel will examine the myriad of challenges that have the potential to escalate into major crises and what can be done to manage instability in this changing security landscape. Well, I hope that very stirring video woke everyone up out of uh, their after lunch uh, digestion. Uh, I'm Anthony Nelson of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, and uh, as the voiceover told us, we're going to be discussing uh, instability in East Asia. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, to lay out right at the beginning that uh, East Asia right now is, is more stable than it was for most of the 20th century. Uh, that doesn't mean that things are fated to stay that way and that there aren't uh, areas of potential concern and flare-ups there. Uh, so we'll be talking about a, a, a number of those. Uh, you all should be familiar with how the panels work by this point, but uh, I'm going to lay out just a few general points, and then we'll introduce each of our panelists individually for about five to seven minutes of their particular areas of focus, and then we'll refer back to the audience for, uh, for some of your questions and, uh, and discussions. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, the U.S.-China relationship, the China-Japan relationship, the uh, North Korea and everybody else relationship, but... Um, I want to lay out a couple, a couple areas of, uh, of, of, of kind of general sources of, of instability that, uh, that at the first can seem to be positive things, but, uh, but can have negative flip sides. First, uh, uh, economic growth. East Asia is, is the world's growth engine at this point. Uh, the World Bank, I think, puts emerging East Asia's uh, uh, growth for the year at around 8%. But uh, 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 grow, uh, economic growth means, means more competition for resources. It means... Uh, Energy, in particular, becomes a, a, a limiting factor as a, the ability to generate power or uh, 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 buy power from somebody else uh, uh, limits the, the, uh, the ability of countries to, to continue to industrialize and continue driving their own growth. Um, countries that uh, in the past have been suppliers of energy uh, that now are growing may need now to consume more of that energy for their own domestic needs. Uh, uh, and uh, our increased ability to to get at resources, uh, whether they're those, uh, those buried under the ocean or, or, or trapped in shale gas, means uh, that areas of overlapping claims that have been maybe purely uh, uh, areas of, of sovereignty concern now have the stakes raised on them because they contain valuable energy resources. So areas that were of conflict before now, uh, now take on even greater significance. Um, the, uh, the water resources... Uh, both uh, simply for consumption, but also to generate hydropower, another area of limit. Uh, we've seen people trying to, to, to lay out plans <coughs> for, for dams uh, along, for example, the Mekong, but, uh, but in resources that are shared by countries, uh, those, uh, those plans that one country make uh, need to, to, to work with the plans that other countries make, and, uh, 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 and that can... That can both damage the ability to use uh, the water sources for, uh, for power generation, but also for food supplies. Um, the uh, economic growth has led to, to, to greater budget allocations for defense capabilities. Um, I think we're looking at about a 10% increase in regional defense budgets uh, year on year. Um, some of that is, uh, is very natural uh, modernization and countries taking adva advantage of, of strong economies to add uh, capabilities that they've needed and to, to, to improve uh, 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 fleets that haven't been modernized in a long time. But it does mean that, uh, that now all of a sudden there's increased presence of, uh, of, of, of vessels in, uh, in areas where there hasn't before and countries need to figure out ways to manage uh, 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 increasing interaction and increasing opportunities for, uh, for encounters. There's also countries deploying capabilities that they haven't had before. Um, where, uh, where, where uh, the, the rules of engagement with a, with a submarine, if a country hasn't ever operated that in their history, uh, creates another opportunity for, uh, for conflict. We're also seeing increased uh, democratization, or at least an increase in the freedom of speech driven by access to the Internet and in information across the region. But uh, that, uh, in general, is, uh, it can be seen as a positive, but it also uh, can lead to a little bit of instability. It means regimes... May, uh, may be less reliable or predictable actors than they have been in the past. Uh, we, uh, we have, for example, an uh, election uh, on the 5th in Malaysia 
that uh, may see the first change of power there uh, in over 50 years. Um, even uh, even in, in countries like Singapore, the grip of the PAP is loosening a bit, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the nation's elected officials are, are, are having to to tack to domestic sentiment a little bit more than they have in the past. A um, country like Myanmar is in the midst of a historic transition, but, uh, but that means there's, there's, uh, there's, there's many more opportunities there for, 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 for conflict. Um, social media and its increased presence can, uh, can give a voice to, to the populace, but it can also be something that's used to, 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 to fuel and steer conflict um, based along ethnic lines. Uh, that's something we're seeing right now a lot, uh, a lot in Myanmar as, as, as uh, uh, social media is allowing um, people to organize and, uh, and, and spread and kind of fan the flames of, of, of ethnic tensions that when the, when the regime was, was, uh, was a, a little bit more uh, autocratic were, were kept under a tighter lid. Um, rising regional nationalist sentiments may lead governments to... Uh, to, to press international claims with an eye on domestic uh, sentiment, meaning that, uh, that we see some of these flare-ups over, over territorial claims uh, where, where, where governments are looking first to, to, to the populace at home and how they'll respond, and then to the international <coughs> situation. Uh, so we'll consider some of these uh, and, uh, and, and a number of key flashpoints as we, as we have our discussion, and if we're feeling particularly creative, we may come up with some, uh, some policy options to deal with some of those. Uh, with that, let me, let me introduce our, our, our first panelist. Uh, professor Hong Kyu Duck is a professor at Sukmyung Women's University. Uh, he served as the Deputy Minister for Defense Reform at the uh, Ministry of National Defense here in Korea. Uh, he also, uh, I want to note, was, uh, was served on the ASEAN Regional Forum's Eminent Persons Group. Uh, and uh, he's the author of Asia Pacific Alliances in the 21st Century. Um, and with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over to you, Professor Hong. Thank you. All right. It's, you know, it's an honor to be here. And uh, as a, you know, the former defense ministers, I mean, the deputy ministers, I'm really working hard to you know, prepare for our increased response against you know, the, in the increasing North Korean threat provocation. So I'll probably the, you know, start with the how we are dealing with the, you know, increasing North Korean threat. So the, as you know, the, the, as a, I mean, after a series of provocation made in 2010, we you know, review everything from the scratch. So the, you know, the proactive deterrence was uh, taken as a new doctrine. And South Korea the, made you know, very clear that the, we have to retaliate you know, if the the provocation is made again. We have to, you know, the the, the strike against the, pro, pro, the origin of the provocation and the supporting forces, and even you know, including the 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 commanding post that give give the orders to you know provocate provoke the, the South Korea. So the, that kind of the kind of the principle is has been maintained. And then even the, the, after Bakune government to take place, you know, this kind of the doctrine has been maintained and further developed. So our concern is, you know, the how we gonna we can avoid the kind of the escalation then, and then the we should not fall into the you know the kind of the commitment trap. So the when you're dealing with the such you know the the very I mean the. The enemy like I mean the, the state like North Korea, you have to make it very sure that we got to I mean really, you know the very promptly and then very strongly. So that's the only way we can prevent you know further provocation. But at the same time, how we can de-escalate the crisis? That's that's the very important challenge. It can be done alone, you know, by Korean government itself. So that's why the, we have to work together with, the, you know, the strategic partners like the United States and the, the China, Japan, and other, you know, regional powers too. So that is our, the, you know, the kind of the, the, the goal as well as dilemma to deal with the, this situation. So I try to, you know, the, the argue that the 
for example, the intelligence, surveillance, and re reconnaissance. These are areas where the, you know, the, the Seoul, the Washington, and Tokyo, and Beijing, and other capitals can help each other. So th this is a very important area. So the, I think you know, in order to avoid that kind of the provocation turn into some you know, the spiral of the dangerous you know, escalation, we have to work together. But unfortunately, the, you know, the, the we are very much concerned about you know, kind of the surging political the nationalism heated by domestic politics. So we should, I mean, the, utilize this opportunity better. So I think the opportunity is open for the, the, I mean, the countries you know, surrounding Korean Peninsula. So my argument is that we, we have to work together and then to protect the national interest and then you know, the safety of the region the, from the politics. Thank you. I must stop here. Thank you very much. Well, I think you've, I think you've hit the nail on the head with the, mm. the difficulty there at the, at the same time mm. having, to, having to react mm. strongly while also wanting to de-escalate the situation. Mm. Mm. And I think uh, as we get further along in the discussion, we can talk more about, uh, mm. about regional architecture mm. and how that can be involved. Mm. Um, well, let's, uh, let's turn to our, our next panelist, uh, Dr. Huang Kui Bo. Uh, Dr. Huang is the director of the International Master's Program in International Studies and an Associate Professor in the Department of Diplomacy at National Changchi University. Uh, between 2009 and 2011, he was Chairman of the Research and Planning Committee at Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and uh, among his publications is In Pursuit of Gradual Stabilization and Peace Dividends, Cross Taiwan Strait Relations, and Their Influence on the Asia Pacific. Uh, so here's another, another uh, potential area of, uh, of, of conflict or flashpoint. Uh, Dr. Quang. Mm. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, also, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to Seoul, this great city. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about the cross time Strait issues because now I don't think it is one of the major destabilizing forces in the Asia Pacific. Rather, I would like to look at many, many different levels, including state, sub-state, and super-state levels to figure out the major resources of instability in East Asia. Uh, of course, I think uh, we have talked about uh, strategic, strategic conflicts and sovereign conflicts among different state actors in the region, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that because we have mentioned that all the time, starting from day one. Uh, the rest three major resources of instability I would like to emphasize include the subjective understanding of East Asian history and problems with good governance and low politics security. And the third and last one is a serious lack of institutionalization of conflict management or prevention in East Asia. These are three other major resources of inst inst uh, instability I have in mind. Uh, let me uh, go through them one by one quickly. Uh, subjective understanding of East Asian history. Actually, I don't want to name names, but I think you know what con which countries I'm referring to. So some countries in the region try to distort or misinterpret the agreed upon history in East Asia. So there have been so many continued disputes between or among you know, these disputants. I have to say that this kind of subjective understanding or interpretation of history would be uh, harmful for the development of East Asian stability and prosperity. So I think we, uh, with that continuing to be present in East Asia, I think that would cause you know, endless disputes in the region. And problems with good governance and low politics threats. Again, as Anthony mentioned, uh, rapid economic growth mm -hmm. and actually associated with a great deal of foreign direct investments in the region have changed the landscape of the region. So 
there has been a lot of social changes in East Asia. Good governance has therefore become very important, not only for states, but for regional organizations to improve uh, the living conditions of the people in East Asia. Some people try to link good governance to democracy, but here I don't want to do that because I personally do not think democracy is a sufficient and uh, you know, it, it's a mature condition for the achievement of good governance because some scholars have argued that you may not need democracy, but you can achieve good governance. That's debatable. What I would like to mention is that maybe climate change, natural disaster management, pandemics like uh, SARS in 2003 and now H7N9 this year taking place in mainland China, and international terrorism, and energy and resources problems. All these things could lead to further destabilization in East Asia. Let me just pick one, energy and resources. Water. Water has become one of the potential problems for future conflict in many, many regions of the world. Uh, some water-rich countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, are also facing some water quality constraints and insufficiency in their major cities, not to mention in some of the countries like Taiwan or some you know, countries without you know, long and big rivers or you know, light water for people's daily life. So I, I think you know, without better management or control over these potential problems, uh, states and regional institutions would be facing the big problems uh, in the near future. The last one, lack of institutionalization of uh, conflict management or conflict prevention. Some people would ask, see, we have had ASEAN, we have had ASEAN Regional Forum, and we have had several US bilateral 2 plus 2 <coughs> meetings. And between US and mainland China, we have had SNED. We have so many of them. But to me, I think most of these mechanisms are probably very verbal. More specifically, we have many, many words, but we need more deeds. We need more deeds. So I think the three possibilities that uh, we need to take better care, good care, so that in the near future we can get rid of the potential emerging conflicts among East Asian countries. And I would like to pro proffer two possible remedies for your considerations. Uh, of course, uh, these, uh, the two remedies would be very slow. They are not so efficiently effective, but I think that's worth trying. The first one is that maybe we need a stronger and deeper civic mutual understanding of the importance of conflict reduction and regional cooperation. That is, we need to enhance people-to-people -people exchanges. Of course, we have seen many, many tourists traveling in the region of East Asia. We also see students going to <coughs> Korea, Japan, mainland China, and Taiwan, and other countries for advanced studies. And migration workers, of course. But these are just, you know, superficial. We need some organized, well-planned activities so that we can better enhance people-to-people -people mutual understanding so that they know they can play a constructive role in maintaining or promoting regional peace and stability. Not to mention, uh, this is the era when the domestic civil society could play a bigger role in their domestic decision making and social media. So in many, many countries that has been democratized or that, I that are democratizing e in, in East Asia, I do believe uh, that these people and the force of civil societies can contribute to some sort of changes 
in the relocation of the authority from the states, from the state governments. So if I may borrow Professor James Rosenau, my own teacher's words, uh, the relocation of authority will be transformed outwards to transnational and supranational organizations, <laughs> sidewards to social movements and NGOs, and inwards to subnational groups. So people power. People gradually will influence their own governments so that the governments will not take some assertive or risky uh, policy options. And one, but I still have to mention that states are still very important. I'm not saying states are not important at all. So, but states and civil society, I think there will be some coordinating mechanism between the two. One last thing, the second remedy, is to create and maintain issue-specific regional regimes aimed at the sources of regional instability instead of a holistic approach to managing the whole regional issues. And also, I would like to say that it would be very unrealistic to rely solely on the United Nations or the United States to be the major stabilizing forces in East Asia. We need some coordination among big players in the region. But to be more specific in a slow way, I think we need some issue-specific regional regimes not some bigger one, wider one. And two possible ways to achieve it. One is that we need to consider the possibility of participation of all directly related actors, all directly relevant actors. Even North Korea, I think some scholars uh, yesterday has mentioned this kind of idea. And Timor-Leste, or even Taiwan, in a meaningful way. Somehow, these actors must join the process so that the, the, the stabilization of East Asia can be truly achieved. And last, whether or not maybe a sub-regional regime would be more ideal so that these actors that haven't been able to join most of the process can have a role in this sub-regional. And this may be less sensitive politically for some major powers. You know, these are just some of my wild thinkings, but hopefully that can trigger more discussions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. Uh, I really particularly appreciate your point about uh, the importance of, of the people-to-people -people exchange, because I think that's often uh, overlooked. But uh, the ability to simply have uh, a, a strong group of people who know <laughs> what the other side is thinking, and particularly the, in the mill-to-mill -mill aspect of that, having, having officers who have experience with officers on the other side can, can, can make a big difference in de-escalating conflicts as, as they come up. Uh, let's turn now to uh, Dr. Ren Zhao. Uh, Dr. Ren is, is currently a professor of international politics at Fudan University, and he's the director of the Center for the Study of Chinese Foreign Policy. Uh, he's held research or teaching, teaching positions at uh, the University of Turku, uh, Nagoya University, and George Washington University. Uh, and he's the author of New Frontiers of China's Foreign Relations, along with Alan Carlson. Uh, Dr. Ren? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. When I look at the East Asian region, I actually see a number of positive uh, developments. In addition to the chair mentioned at the very beginning, uh, I can uh, add uh, a couple more things. For example, uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, negotiations, uh, FTA negotiations uh, got started last month, uh, clearly aiming to uh, the formation of a free trade area among them. Um, another thing is that the regional economic uh, regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, which involves uh, 13 East Asian countries plus Australia, New Zealand, and India, uh, will uh, get started uh, next month, uh, meaning that the region is becoming uh, increasingly interdependent and integrated. Uh, um, 
The region across the Taiwan Strait has been uh, not only peaceful and stable over the, over the uh, last five, six years, uh, but also that um, um, a series of uh, progresses have been made uh, in terms of a more constructive cross-Taiwan Strait uh, relations. In the meantime, uh, the standoff of uh, China-Japan uh, between China and Japan on the islands is continuing. Uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula has not been very quiet recently. Uh, and there are other uh, disputes, uh, as you know uh, very well. Overall, I'm not pessimistic uh, about uh, the region. And perhaps we can use the word complex to characterize uh, uh, East Asia. Let me use the rest of my time to uh, uh, briefly mention uh, three things uh, which I see as sources of difficulty. Number one is the burden of history. Um, uh, I do think, well, excuse me, uh, I have to mention Japan here. Uh, I do believe that Japan has been uh, peaceful and, and, and is peaceful. Um, uh, Japan has uh, achieved uh, so much uh, over uh, the last 60 years. Uh, um, <clears throat> in the meantime, um, I was disappointed uh, about uh, 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 the, the unsuccessfulness uh, on the part of Japan to understand uh, the feelings and wishes of the peoples uh, of the neighboring of these neighboring countries. Uh, Japan has not very successful in terms of winning uh, the hearts and minds of the neighboring uh, uh, countries. Uh, um, and so, so the burden of, of, of history is, uh, is uh, quite, quite heavy. Um, so it is, uh, it is a, 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 a serious question for the East Asian countries. Uh, what, they sh what kinds of efforts they should make uh, for a, a not, not just, no, I, I don't like the word apology, because apology is a one-way street, but reconciliation, uh, which is a two-way street, uh, to better achieve a reconciliation uh, between the Asian, uh, East Asian countries. Second thing is uh, uh, national, uh, nationalism, which is not a good thing uh, for, uh, to me. And it exists in, uh, in all the East Asian uh, countries. And we need antidote uh, to dissipate uh, the unhealthy uh, sentiments among uh, the uh, East Asian countries. Third thing, at the, the personal level, I think political figures uh, have, uh, have to bear special responsibility, uh, uh, which I want to underscore is that um, the uh, un irresp irresponsible uh, acts by, by politicians uh, would, uh, would um, uh, make things worse um, to, uh, by uh, to cause the, the involvement of, of, of societies, uh, and so on. Um, and let me uh, conclude by uh, mentioning three things that which I think uh, uh, we should do uh, to reduce tensions. Um, number one is uh, avoid miscalculation. For example, I was surprised to hear uh, one Japanese friend uh, who feared that uh, uh, China would uh, somehow use military means to take over uh, the Diaoyu Islands. Um, and I was not very successful to, to persuade her uh, uh, that would not happen. Um, but she, does, she just has this uh, Fear, uh, and I, I said to her, uh, don't misread, and don't misunderstand uh, 
the, the, the developments and, and things that have been uh, happening in the region. Second, uh, uh, the, the, the concerned parties have to sit down and discuss uh, what they should do to avoid military conflict. It is, it is not time, or, or it, we, don't have, we do not have uh, mature conditions to, to solve the sovereignty issue. Uh, but for the time being, it is very important uh, uh, for us to discuss how to avoid uh, military uh, conflict, to, to keep the uh, situation under uh, control. Uh, lastly, I, I believe uh, media has a special uh, role to play. Um, very often, they tend to be uh, sensational. Uh, they tend to be exaggerating uh, things, um, and uh, uh, which uh, uh, ch triggers uh, uh, unhealthy uh, sentiments uh, toward each other. Um, so, uh, those are the things I, I would like to to uh, mention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reva. I, I think uh, later on, I, I, I think we should return to your point about, uh, mm. about hearts and minds, because I, I don't think anyone in the region has been particularly successful at winning, at winning hearts and minds in other, in other countries. It's not, it's not just Japan, but uh, uh, I think mm -hmm. that is an interesting point. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but for now, we'll move on uh, to our next presenter, uh, which is Lieutenant General uh, Yamaguchi Noburu. Uh, General Yamaguchi uh, is uh, currently professor and director at the National Defense Academy of Japan. Uh, he held responsibilities as a commanding general of the GSDF Research and Development Command until uh, he retired from active duty in December 2008. And uh, he's also served in the Prime Minister's office as special advisor to the Cabinet for Crisis Management. Uh, general Yamaguchi. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, my my thank to, to Asan Institute. And I enjoy uh, this opportunity very much. And I, 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 perhaps I need to cooperate with uh, uh, Professor Ren to convince uh, your friends and my friends uh, not to believe that you know, Chinese are uh, uh, using military force to take over uh, the IOU island. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, to work together. Mm -hmm. And today, I, uh, let me focus on rather dry aspects of uh, uh, instability. Uh, uh, just uh, taking a look at uh, uh, cap capabilities of uh, military capabilities here. Uh, in, uh, in other words, uh, um, the significant uh, trends in arms, uh, arms build-up uh, in this region. And uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, characteristics uh, uh, different from other uh, regions, uh, arms, arms build-up, uh, particularly in comparison with uh, uh, Europe during the Cold War. Uh, if you look at Southeast Asia uh, in the last two to three decades, uh, um, particularly nations surrounding South China Sea have been working really hard to build up their naval capabilities. But this is not uh, too much uh, because uh, the, uh, their capabilities used to be well below the necessity uh, for securing their uh, coastal areas. So their, their, their efforts uh, should be welcomed by, by others uh, because uh, uh, their efforts may uh, bring the more security in that region. Um, <coughs> So that is one. Another point uh, in this region is if you look at Northeast Asia, it is one of the most mil militarized uh, uh, areas in the world. Um, in, on, on this peninsula, um, uh, one, uh, one million uh, North Korean troops are in arms, and uh, 600,000 uh, 600, uh, South Korean friends are, are in arms uh, um, around uh, DMZ. This is quite a uh, highly dense, uh, dense military population. If you look at uh, the Taiwan Strait too, um, if you divide the Taiwan's, uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, active duty personnel by land, land mass, uh, every one kilometer uh, uh, square, um, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, uh, there are uh, seven to eight uh, Taiwanese uh, soldiers, which is almost similar to North Korean uh, density, North Korean uh, armed forces density. This is really the high, and uh, it may, uh, may have uh, uh, co might have caused a lot of cost on, uh, on the lives, uh, lives of Taiwanese, Chinese, and the North Koreans, South Koreans. And that is uh, another point. And in, uh, another point is very interesting. Uh, China and Japan are, are major powers in the world. Uh, even after the end of uh, Cold War, 
uh, those two countries have increased uh, the uh, uh, defense uh, military expenditures. Now, my colleagues in Tokyo uh, have been arguing that China is spending too much, saying that uh, China's military spending is uh, 18 times larger than uh, it, uh, it, uh, that of uh, uh, 20 years ago. But it's not, uh, uh, Japan is not, uh, Japan is not an exe uh, exe <coughs> exemption. Uh, uh, if you look at the uh, WIWS military balance of uh, uh, 1992 version, uh, you, you may see the, uh, um, the uh, chart showing the military spendings of uh, major countries, uh, US, uh, European countries, uh, Japan. And every country except for Japan uh, made a sharp drop after 1987, 1988 because of the demise of the Cold War. Japan, Japan only Japan uh, kept The increasing uh, defense budget up until uh, the uh, collapse of the uh, bubble, uh, bubble economy. So, um, Anthony is right. Uh, because of uh, rapid growth of uh, economy uh, in this region, made the uh, military spending much more uh, than uh, uh, we used to spend, uh, China, China's case as well. So, uh, those three points lead me a um, couple of thoughts. And one is If you uh, look at Southeast China, uh, Southeast China Sea, um, the problem is not the excessive uh, uh, military powers, but rather lack of uh, naval capabilities of uh, region, uh, regional, regional countries. So um, e rather than uh, looking for a kind of uh, arms control, reducing excessive uh, arms to, to some extent, uh, rather than that, we may have to look at the Uh, different kind of arms control, which is harmonized or coordinated uh, build-up uh, for regional security. Uh, that is one. And another point is uh, we need to, 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 uh, to avoid kind of security dilemma. Um, you know, um, China is spending more and more because China's uh, GDP is just growing. Uh, China's uh, military spending is not too big uh, in terms of uh, percentage uh, out of uh, GDP. Uh, but uh, um, the, uh, from the uh, neighbor's perspective, particularly Southeast Asian countries, smaller countries, that may be huge. So uh, we may have to avoid kind of insecurity uh, caused by security dilemma. That requires us kind of uh, uh, more and more uh, deeper, uh, deeper uh, consultation uh, among, the, uh, among uh, regional militaries uh, in, in the coming decades. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Yamaguchi, uh, and thank you for making the point that uh, the uh, regional defense spending is, is cyclical, and, and, and in a way it's natural to have a, a, an upswing in spending right now. I think, I think the, the, the concern for stability is, is not the defense spending, but the, but the changing capabilities, um, which, uh, which make it possible for, uh, for, uh, for North Korea with missiles to menace uh, Japan in a way it couldn't before, or, a, or a Vietnam with a submarine to... to, to to engage in, in, in quite different ways. Um, I want to throw out a, a question for, for the panel, jumping off um, uh, something that Dr. Huang said about, um, about the amount of, of, of regional architecture that we have uh, in East Asia and the degree to which it is helpful and the degree to which it is not helpful. Um, for, uh, for better or for worse, ASEAN has become kind of the convener of the, of the, of the key pieces of, of political and security regional architecture with the, the ASEAN Regional Forum and, and the, uh, the, the East Asia Summit. Um, of course, ASEAN is, is limited by its own, uh, its own policy of non-interference and its, its members' internal affairs. Um, people often want to, um, want to, to make the comparison that, that Myanmar could be an example for North Korea uh, uh, as a path forward, but of course, uh, Myanmar was involved in, in, in ASEAN and in regional organizations since, uh, since 1997. Um, so, uh, Professor Hong, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you, is, is, there, is there greater opportunity to, to involve North Korea in, in, in regional architecture? Is the current regional architecture something they could be drawn into, or, or, or do we need to create new structures? You know, the, as you are well aware that the, we strongly hope that North Korea should involve in, you know, the, the regional part the countries or states, you know, for, I mean, helping the situation better. But the problem is that they only want to talk to the United States as a sole, you know, the negotiator at the, you know, the, the, the negotiation table, which is only dealing with, you know, the, as a nuclear power state. They, they only want, uh, on, you know, others to recognize North Korea as a 
nuclear state power. So this is absurd, and then, you know, we, we can't do that. So this is the, the problem. So as you just mentioned, we have lots of, you know, the, the institutions you know, dealing with some security, but the, the, they, all they want is, you know, the, the nuclear issue. So mm -hmm. the, that really make us very difficult to, you know, suggest that, you know, them to join the others. Sure. So we, we keep, but at the same time, the, we should not, you know, the, give up our efforts to convince them to, you know, look around the way, because as you just mentioned, Myanmar is the way, and Vietnam is the country. They, they never had, you know, the chance to develop their nuclear option, but still they can join the others and then to, you know, after Doi Moi policy. They, it's now you know very affluent country, right? So the mm -hmm. the so the North Korea should find the, the example, but the problem is they are now uh, the, the young leader Kim Jong Un is only focusing on nuclear options. So that that's the the big challenge for us. Sure. Um, the the one of the one of the positives and and, mm. and negatives about mm. ASEAN is it has. A million mm. meetings about mm. a, a, a million things, um, mm. and I think uh, is there a possibility then to, to to try to draw North Korea into some purely unrelated meetings mm. uh, 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 focused on on building mm. people to people or agricultural concerns or other mm. things like that? Uh, mm. uh, Dr. Huang, did you want to raise something? Yeah, I, it just reminds me of some past examples of ASEAN inviting mainland China to ASEAN summit in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So, if my memory serves me correctly. Mainland China attended ASEAN summit in the capacity of chairman's friend. Chairman's friend invited by chairman of ASEAN summit. So I think that could be one of the very possible way, you know, to draw North Korea into some sort of regional socialization mechanisms without triggering, triggering more political, you know, worries of, you know, either South Korean, Japan, or North Koreans. Makes sense. Dr. I'm Ren. not. I'm not optimistic about that uh, because uh, uh, DPRK uh, has been a member of uh, at least more than one <laughs> regional groupings, uh, AIF, Asia Regional Forum, for example. Uh, but it has been on and off for a long time, uh, and recently they withdrew from uh, the Greater Truman Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, and, an Asian issue to try to develop a uh, Northeast uh, Asian uh, region. And uh, they uh, utilized this uh, as, as their tactics to, to achieve what, what they wanted, uh, my observation. So, so it has been difficult uh, to use, use regional architecture or groupings. But I have uh, two cents thoughts. Mm -hmm. That is, being willing to be utilized by North Koreans, because our major goal is to draw them into our game. So uh, the past failures, uh, including ARF or some others, would be mostly you know, political, politically or military oriented. So if, just, just a big if, we can, not we, ASEAN, <laughs> for example, can invite North Korea to join some of the non-political, non-military you know, uh, meetings so that North Korea can at least see the world, engage the world, and maybe we are going to have a very small step, then we can fo be followed by bigger steps. Yeah, generally, yeah, uh, ASEAN has a, a wonderful record on uh, the, their efforts uh, to deal with piracy. Uh, it used to be uh, in the 1990s, uh, uh, the South China Sea is the most uh, frequent uh, piracy uh, area and uh, some you know, 40 to 50 percent of all the pilots' uh, accident uh, incidents were uh, hap happening there. But now uh, it's no less than uh, 10 percent uh, because of the uh, cooperation between regional countries uh, as well as outside countries. Uh, China, uh, Chinese law enforcement has been working really hard and uh, Japanese has been uh, helping regional countries to, to provide them with uh, surveillance capabilities. That, is, uh, uh, that can be applied for the future, uh, future uh, you know, better uh, areas. And that may even um, extend it to, uh, to North Korean benefit. Mm -hmm. 
And the positive thing about that is yeah. it, it, it involves both a, a political to political and, and, and mill to mill contacts and builds build some, some familiarity on, on, on a couple of key issues. Well, as, as we know, next year, Myanmar is the, the ASEAN chair, and they've taken some heat for their relationship with North Korea. So, so maybe we'll have to wait until Malaysia comes in in 2015 mm -hmm. to suggest someone invite them as a, as a special friend. Um, why don't we open this up to, to the floor? Um, Walter, over here. Um, it, it seems like to me we're overlooking a major source of instability. The, um, the problem of subjective understanding of history is not just a Japanese issue. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's driving instability now is the, the Chinese narrative about its own history, its sense of grievance, uh, the way that it weaves in the various territorial disputes in the region. All of those, all of the facts surrounding the South China Sea or the East China Sea or the Sinkagos are all disputed. It's not as if Japan is the only one that has a history or, you know, a, an interpretation of that history. China has its own mm -hmm. history, and at least mm -hmm. in the South China Sea, it's creating a lot of instability. That is how it paints this, the, this particular history. I wonder if you all can address that. Thank you, Walter. And, and I, I think that's, that, that, that's a key point, that, that, um, that all of these problems are, are, are sort of bound up in other problems. Mm -hmm. If I may jump ahead yes. for just a quick response. So, okay. I, I use pluralism to refer to countries with subjective interpretation of East Asian history. So actually, I'm referring to you know, more than two countries <laughs> with some you know, misunderstanding about mm -hmm. our history. Sure. Yeah. Dr. Ren, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a, a short answer to the question is, I agree. Um, and uh, in recent years, uh, Japan and China, uh, well, they formed a, a joint committee on history textbooks, and they did some work and uh, produced at least one volume mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, co uh, wrote uh, to co write a a, a a history textbook for for use in in both countries. Uh, unfortunately, that if effort has been affected by uh, the crisis uh, broke out uh, last year. Uh, so uh, there's no progress recently. Uh, this is one way that uh, uh, our two countries, uh, Japan and China, uh, can, can work together. And uh, I think uh, there are other uh, ways and, uh, and uh, can involve other countries, for example, Korea, uh, to, to make efforts. So I think basically you are right. General. Yeah, I tend to see the difference between European nation states and uh, Asian nation states. And the Asian uh, countries are relatively new uh, in terms of dealing with other countries, uh, particularly for border issue or territorial disputes, uh, while the you know, European countries are so accustomed to dealing with those issues uh, in the last um, in the hundreds of years. Uh, so um, the Asian countries are not accustomed uh, to uh, um, uh, those disputes. Um, in, uh, within such uh, countries, uh, China is most, uh, one of the most experienced. China has mm -hmm. been working really hard uh, with Russians, Indians, and other countries. So um, we are now at the kind of uh, at the learning, learning curve. And Japan um, is uh, uh, no exception, and uh, we are really uh, new to deal uh, to those uh, territorial disputes, so sovereign issue is really new um, and hard to, to to make compromises. Yeah, I, th I think it's quite difficult as as an international community to to address uh, 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 individual countries' interpretation or understanding of events as as they happened. But uh, but what we can do at least is, is is figure out what are the facts on the ground and and, and what can we separate from that kind of morass of, of, of what happened to, to say these are at least the, 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 the things that we all can agree are, are, are happening right now and that we have no particular choice but to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions from the floor? Uh, well, why don't we return to, to the idea of, 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 of winning hearts and minds. Um, we've, uh, we've seen uh, um, some efforts from, from China, in, in, in particular, over time, to, to roll out what was called the, the, the Charm Offensive in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's rolled back a little bit. Um, um, mm -hmm. 
Dr. Wren, uh, can you can you talk a little bit about um, about about how that has been successful or, or, or not successful, and what what maybe China needs to do in the future to address that? All right. Um, let's uh, use the example of China and ASEAN. Um, in 1991, uh, they for, they formed they agreed to form a strategic uh, partnership, and since then. Uh, uh, China and ASEAN have been uh, 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 have, have successfully created uh, a China ASEAN uh, FTA, and uh, uh, by and large, they they both uh, they both benefited from uh, this uh, formation of uh, a free trade area. Um, uh, politically, they. Uh, uh, solved uh, first bilaterally, uh, 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 established all the bilateral relationship, diplomatic relationships. And the, the last, the final two ones w uh, were Indonesia and, and Singapore. And based on that, uh, China and ASEAN as a group have uh, 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 developed their relationship uh, 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 quite well. Uh, uh, politically, uh, they uh, agreed to uh, to uh, set aside uh, their disagreement, uh, their, their differences, and uh, uh, they uh, came up with a, uh, a DOC declaration of, of uh, conduct on in, in South China Sea. Um, but. How successful uh, the DOC has been is, is, is an open question. Uh, uh, and um, uh, what are the other things? Um, um, in recent years, uh, it has appeared that uh, there have been, there have been a, a series of, of uh, disputes, the emergence of disputes. Um, and I think, well, the disputes have been there for many years. For example, China and, and Japan. Uh, and uh, it, it is not possible for them to, to be solved uh, anytime soon. So the, the issue, uh, I think, is that uh, what we should do to, to manage them and to manage the disputes uh, well. I think that is the uh, uh, the, the question. Um, um, so overall, I, I think uh, uh, we we have we have seen um, uh, quite a few um, positive developments. And yes, Dr. Wang. If I would like, to, I can add. Uh, you know, uh, Nicole University of Southern California has identified five major approaches to public diplomacy, trying to win in hearts and minds of the people. And so I think what East Asian countries in general is lacking is the ability to listen. The very <laughs> first technique, ver very first approach identified by Nicholas Cole. So I think all the governments in East Asia not only need to carry out a lot of constructive programs like AIDS or educational programs, exchange programs, but to listen, to listen to your con counterparts' needs and feelings so that you know these countries can win people's hearts and minds. Thank you, that's a great point. We, we had a question in the second row and then the front row over here. Uh, Dominic Ziegler from The Economist. Um, I'd love to ask the panelists whether the emergence of uh, China's articulation of core interests, uh, most recently towards the Senkaku and Jiaoyu Islands, um, adds to stability in the region or detracts from it. That's a great question. Great question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> will, uh, what, what kind of effect it, it will have on um, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, dispute? But I, I think uh, it, is, it was an emphasis uh, that uh, uh, telling uh, the, the visiting guests, uh, General Demp Dempsey, for example, uh, telling them uh, that uh, this is an, a, a, a very important issue for us. Um, 
And uh, uh, the concerned parties have to be careful. Let us be careful uh, uh, in terms of handling of the the uh, dispute. And 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 this. so so I I uh, uh, believe that it was a, a emphasis. Okay. General Yamaguchi, do you want to add something? Um, my answer is the same. I don't know, but uh, the, I, I, I felt like uh, China is big, and China's core is bigger than Japanese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Chris Nelson and I, um, I had the honor of chairing the, uh, the history uh, discussion this morning, and Professor Ren, I wish you'd been on my panel, uh, is all I can say. Um, uh, to follow up on, on some of the themes raised, and also to follow up on, on the question of the distinguished gentleman from, uh, from the FT. Um, the, the notion of, of trying to find ways to, to let, the, you know, if not regional architecture, regional players help each other diffuse some of the specific it is bilateral uh, uh, debates, I, I find uh, both intriguing and potentially positive because for all the reasons we've been discussing, uh, particularly when it's a nationalist-based problem or a potential resource-based uh, 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 territorial sovereignty dispute, uh, when it's just bilateral, uh, it, it seems almost impossible to think of ways to get out of it. Uh, because it, you know, it, 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 some, it, it always seems to be something of a zero-sum game for one side or the other side. Uh, is it possible to think creatively about regional approaches to diffusing, for example, uh, the, the history, some of the history disputes, uh, 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 to find ways to have, to have, uh, uh, for example, you know, the Comfort Women tragedy, which. Uh, tends to be portrayed mostly as a Japan-Korea uh, uh, issue, when in fact, of course, it, it was a, a pan-Asia issue. Uh, uh, all the women of Asia were involved in one way or another in this tragedy. And as Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, uh, uh, tried to emphasize uh, towards the end of last year, uh, the link of the Comfort Women tragedy is to the modern uh, international uh, movement and awareness uh, of violence against women. It's a, it's a problem right now, today. It isn't just something that was 60 years or 80 years ago. So I'm asking, do you, do you think we might be able to be more creative in how we try to help each other overcome uh, these horribly bitter uh, uh, nationalist personal disputes by, in a sense, broadening them to, a, to the community. We all have a community interest in peace and stability and getting along. Uh, uh, maybe we should try to bring some of these terribly painful bilateral issues to a, a broader community-based uh, approach. Thank you. Wonder, Professor Hong, do you want to reply to that? Well, not not exactly that issue, okay. but you know, the when you mentioned that the how we're gonna win the hearts and minds okay. of the people, you know, this might be a what good example for Korea. You know, the in 2007 when the the China has you know the some huge earthquake took place in Sichuan province, you know, the <coughs> President Lee Myung Ba decide to go down to, you know, the Suchan province himself. So there was at that time, you know, lots of worries. And then, and also the, from the Chinese part also, there is some reservation too. But he did it by himself. And then also the Korean Air Force, for the first time after Korean arm, armistice, you know, they send three air, I mean, cargo, so see, so one sort of three, you know, full of, you know, the, so the disaster relief, you know, goods to send you know, those places and then try to the, educate the people that the Korean people that even the, I mean China and South Korea doesn't really have an improved relationship in that you know, the, I mean, area of security cooperation. But that was the good you know, part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the crisis response initiative is mm -hmm. kind of the area where the, the you know, different countries can help each other for the future. I agree. I, I think we've seen a, a couple areas where, where mm. HADR cooperation mm. has, been, has been extremely effective mm. in, 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 uh, 
in, in building people-to-people -people ties and, 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 uh, and, and, and just helping resolve terrible situations, absolutely. In, uh, in addition to, to HADR, uh, UNPKO, uh, peacekeeping mm. operations, uh, provide us with uh, opportunity to cooperate uh, with others. Uh, for, uh, for example, a good example is uh, our first ever peacekeeping operation in Cambodia mm -hmm. was done with uh, Chinese uh, uh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. Chinese engineer battalion uh, deployed the north of us, uh, which is uh, more dangerous, so that uh, the Japanese uh, self-defense forces enjoyed safer mm -hmm. environment, while uh, PLA uh, suffered from two, uh, two KIAs and dozens of uh, uh, injured. Um, we, and we actually the, the, we are helped by PLA. Mm -hmm. And in East Timor, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, uh, thanks to the Korean Infantry Battalion, mm -hmm. our engineer battalion was uh, um, enjoying a safe uh, uh, operational environment. In such uh, cases, uh, our troops are uh, you know, uh, side, you know, side by side, uh, shoulder to shoulder, and working together for uh, the same, same, uh, same purpose. That is one of the uh, uh, places we need to play up. If I add up of course. a little bit about you know, General Yamaguchi's the statement and you know, the, we, the Korea, we are going to send our PKO unit to Sudan, Ooh. the South Sudan. And then South Sudan is where the Chinese PLA and then Japanese the PKO forces are the operating now. Mm -hmm. So that must be the way the three countries can eat, you know, help each other. So we're very much looking for that chance. Great. We had a, a question right over here. Yes, this gentleman. Yeah, my name is Yung Sun Pao from Korea. I'd like to mention about the, the role of the political leadership. Uh, we have been discussing the new leadership in Korea, Japan, and China will make a difference, and we have a high expectation. But so far, uh, they serve as a source of instability as well as stability in the new environment. I'm just wondering, uh, each of these panelists to see it, it, that there is a possibility, anyhow, this younger, better educated the leadership uh, will uh, do a better job uh, to reconcile and harmonize uh, East Asian uh, affairs in the future. Does anybody want to uh, respond to that? And it's not just uh, China, Japan, Korea. Mm -hmm. We've also seen recent changes in the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, we have a presidential election coming up in Indonesia, an important one in Malaysia very soon. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ren? Perhaps uh, briefly, uh, a brief response to Chris, uh, your question. And I was sorry I, I missed your panel because I was in a different session. <laughs> uh, on your question of bilateral or, or multilateral, um, I think what um, uh, uh, the government officials uh, often find is that um, uh, when three sides are involved uh, to discuss something, uh, it would be become uh, much more difficult than uh, two sides are talking with each other. Uh, two side, when to two sides are talking with each other, it's, it's much easier. And when three sides and, and more sides are involved, <laughs> it's, it's becoming, it's, it, it would, would become uh, very, very difficult for them to, uh, to uh, find a uh, uh, way out. Um, I would, uh, uh, but I think that uh, a, a check to dialogue involving uh, three parties, uh, for example, uh, can, can be useful. Uh, to, because they, are, they, they have dialogues in a more relaxed way uh, to fully exchange uh, views uh, between and among them um, and uh, uh, come up with suggestions um, and recommendations. And, and those suggestions and recommendations can be, uh, can be uh, accepted by, by the government. So uh, that might be a, a, uh, uh, a good uh, uh, way to, to move forward. Great. Um, if, we, if we can return to the, to the leadership question over here, I, I wonder, if, if Professor Hong, if, if you might want to address how the changes in leadership have changed the, the, the North Korea-South Korea dynamic. Well, the, you know, it is still difficult for you know, the, the, us to give a kind of momentum because, you know, find a momentum because 
the North Korea young leaders still, you know, the, I mean, the announce that they try to convince the world that, you know, it can hurt others. And then even I don't know whether he knew what he said, you know, himself, but mm -hmm. the, he uh, recently he just made it very clear that he will preemptively use the nuclear weapon against, you know, the, not only South Korea, Japan, and, you know, the, all the surrounding countries. So the, this is, you know, I mean, unacceptable. So when the leadership the, use that kind of a strong rhetoric, it, there's very difficult for others, I mean, to teach, you know, the, some kind of peace education. So there are certain, I mean, limitations, but, you know, after I just finish it, you know, the government job, and then return to campus, I mean, the class, in my class, I have a, a couple of students from Japan and China and Mongols. So I was quite surprised to see, you know, the, the foreign students are, my, I mean, the, the re listening to my lecture. So the, I try to emphasize that how we can help each other and how we can construct for the future. So that kind of attitude is very much needed and then we will probably work very hard to you know, teach you know, students to the build for the future. Correct. Mm. Uh, speaking on the new leadership issue, you know, it's just my hunch that among North Asian countries, including, you know, our countries here, I think newer leadership might be able to bring out the opportunities of, you know, coming to a, a more stable relations mm. rather than, you know, their assertive interactions. Uh, Take the cross Taiwan Strait relations, for example. You know, I think uh, when Xi Jinping comes to power and Taiwan's mind you continues his second term, you can see maybe even though there hasn't been any salient progress in cross Strait relations, but such relations have maintained stable, which is good in comparison with its past 60 years, good enough. So gradually, hopefully, we can make some progress in the future. But in Southeast Asia, I think what I would stress is this new leadership's ability for good governance. Again, my previous topic. You know, if you look at World Bank's criterion on, or, uh, on good governance, accountability and political stability and government effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera, and rule of law would be very important for these leaders. Uh, so I don't exclude the possibility that if this new leadership in Southeast Asia cannot maintain their good governance ability, then maybe there will be some divergent you know, effect on their domestic or foreign policies, which will further destabilize the region or the sub-region. Sure. Um, General? Yeah. Um, maybe my, my view is uh, kind of uh, the view on the neighbor's lawn uh, looks um, greener. And Chinese power tradition uh, looks better than the Japanese power tradition and the uh, Koreans as well. And the, in terms of uh, Japan, um, I, I wish uh, if uh, the strong uh, support of, uh, for, for Abe makes uh, Abe more relaxed and the, uh, uh, hopefully uh, becoming a kind of Japanese Nixon um, in the future. He was, he was Nixon in 2006 when he made that uh, uh, ice-breaking trip That's to, to, to China and That's Korea. Right. 2006. They've just flashed the, the five minutes on me, so we have time for one or two more. If there are other uh, questions from the floor. One, uh, one issue that I would like uh, to raise that we haven't actually talked about as a, as a source of, of mm. instability is there are still some, some long-running insurgencies um, going on in, 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 in East Asia, in, 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 uh, in Thailand, in the south, in, in, um, in the Philippines, uh, although that seems to be getting a little bit better, and, and, and in Myanmar there's still a number of ethnic uh, uh, conflicts going on. And in particular, I note uh, there was a, a, a report that was widely spread in the last day or so about... Uh, about China passing uh, attack helicopters to the WA. Um, and I, I wonder if some of the panelists might, might uh, uh, like to, to, to comment a bit on, on, on those issues. I, I haven't heard of anything about you mentioning, <laughs> but I do know 
uh, that um, uh, we played a role to uh, bring together uh, uh, Myanmar government officials and the, the, uh, the rebellions together in uh, really Yunnan for a kind of mediating role uh, mm -hmm. for them, bring them together to have dialogues uh, and to find, out, to find our way out and uh, uh, that happened twice, I, I believe, uh, uh, which I think is China is, is uh, slowly changing its its uh, this way of thinking uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, help helping uh, the, the, uh, one of the of a neighboring country countries to. To, to uh, solve their, their domestic problem, mm -hmm. uh, s something like that, uh, which may be a, a, a healthy, uh, a, a good thing. Uh, People, yes, you know, the, having another question, I, I will just mention about, you know, the when you mentioned about, you know, touch upon the disparities. Uh -huh. So the, when we look at the, you know, disparities, between the North Korea and other the countries, mm -hmm. we better look at you know the the disparities even growing within North Korean regime. That is a very important factor. Even you know the if you look at the Kim Jong Un and his close you know the 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 staff members that are showing up on TV, they are enjoying you know some the Japanese style you know the the cuisine and very luxurious. And then that, you know, sh shouldn't be, you know, I mean, the, the reach to the, their countrymen, I mean, the people, ordinary people. But so that's why the, I think, you know, the, the, the China, the Japan, Korea, United States, and other, you know, regional parties will probably focus on how we can reduce the gap between, mm -hmm. you know, the ordinary North Korean people and those, you know, handful, the, you know, powerful, the, the clique, Within Pyongyang, so we will be we will probably more creative to you know to create some the established kind of the the you know the informal regimes or the you know use the I mean the the institution we have. So, but you know the must what is very important is the we have to give them kind of a hope for the future. So absolutely. we are not forgetting them. So that is very important, you know, the That's message we should give. Absolutely, a source of, uh, been a source of instability in a, in a number of countries in the um, region. It's the primary driver of, of, the, of the, the, the conflicts in, in Thailand, and mm -hmm. it's uh, going to be a serious challenge for Myanmar over the next mm -hmm. couple of years. Um, we've been told that we need to, to wrap up, but I want to give my panelists a chance, if they would like, to make a very brief uh, final statement. Uh, General? Yeah, uh, just one point. Uh, we may have to look for um, the kind of code of conduct uh, on the maritime theater. Maybe the other uh, panel uh, will be, uh, may be di discussing, but this is really uh, important because our navies are growing and the uh, interaction uh, getting more and more frequent. And then uh, we have to have a rule, a uh, common rule uh, to follow. Great. Uh, Dr. Ren? <coughs> no, I don't. No, great. So maybe very quick, on the East China Sea issue, you know, Taiwan has launched an East China Sea Peace Initiative calling for uh, three sets of bilateral cooperation coordination among Taiwan, Japan, and China. Then ultimately leading to a trilateral cooperation and coordination, which is very hard to achieve, but I think it's good to know that. You know, you know, the, to prevent further provocation from North Korea, we got to help, I mean, need to coordinate with the Japan and China and others. So, the, you know, the, you definitely need, you know, some the intelligence cooperation with the Japan. But the problem is, you know, the, you know, the some political, I mean, national sentiments, I mean, from right. the domestic politics. We can't, you know, the proceed any, anymore. So the, that that should be you know the I mean considered and then also the China, we we are very much looking for Chinese you know larger role in influencing North Korea. Right. I'll stop here. Thank well, you. we didn't solve all the problems, but we had some some good ideas. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists and thanks to the Asan Institute. Enjoy your coffee.